Todd, what do you think we can do to move past the referendum result? And is it possible for a treaty? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I, um, to, get to, to get to your answer, I need, I need to contextualise it in where we are now in Australia, uh, particularly after a no vote. Um, and to do that, I want to walk you through what it was like for me. So before I left my house, I live in the seat of Melbourne, um, I was wearing an always was, always will be Aboriginal jumper on. I think we've all seen them. Um, and I looked in the mirror and I took it off. And I didn't want to be identifiable in the line. It was the first time I ever voted in Australia where I was like, I just want to disappear. I don't want anybody to know who or what I am. And I got home feeling a bit down from that experience. Um, and then a friend texted me later that evening saying, I'm sorry. So I didn't have the TV on, I didn't have the radio on. And that was how I found out. Um, I felt numbness for the very first time in my life. I walked around my apartment um, shell-shocked for about three or four hours. I couldn't form a word. I couldn't form a sentence. I couldn't understand what had just happened. Um, and over the next four days, I remained in that apartment. I didn't want to leave the door. Like, I didn't want to go outside. Um, I live in an area where, you know, it's, I'm identifiable. And I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to have a bar of it. And I wasn't alone in that experience. Many of my friends and family who are Aboriginal went through that very same experience, that we felt utterly rejected. We felt the shame of that rejection. And when the shame set in, maybe day three or four, that we dared to ask Australia a very, very modest ask, it was very overwhelming. That shame, I think, has really uh, been felt right across many Aboriginal communities, right across Australia. Um, and we went into then a, a week of silence. And that week really was to mourn decades, decades of hard work, to mourn leaders, like Marcia and Noel and others who had put their heart, soul and entire life on the line for this. And I had to watch Marcia on the TV the next day get up and pretend like it didn't happen. And that was gut-wrenching um, to see. And what we're seeing now, particularly, you know, uh, when what we're hearing are these stories of, you know, I, I was recently talking with a grandmother and she told me about the story that of her, her boat, and what she did was she took her grandkids with... They went to their, their grandkids' school, public school, to vote. And then she talked to me about this idea that two days later she had to send that kid back to that public school, where for that kid perhaps is now a site of cultural violence, public schools or voting centres, and now this kid has to go there and realise that this is the place where Australia voted no. You know, that might be just one isolated case, but I, I suspect that it might not be. Um, and... What we're seeing and, and I think what we're feeling is, is a, um, that utter rejection has caused political apathy. What I mean by that is this idea that, they don't, that, that people aren't feeling valued or worth, have worth in, in society. So we've got a lot of work to do to fix that before we do anything else. Now, treaty is going to take a very, very long time. Treaties, I should say, will take a very, very long time. But we do have, right across Australia, governments who are in the conversation about treaties, who are progressing treaties in a really, really good way. But it's going to take a, it's going to take a while. And often what I say to people, particularly to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, is yes, talk to our communities and our leaders about what it is that we want out of a treaty. But for non-Indigenous people, what do you want out of a treaty? Mm. I can't tell you that. Like, if, if you don't know, as we found out on, on October 14th, Australians told the truth for the first time, they don't know, um, then what do you want to know? What is it that we can show you? Uh, why it is that we desperately needed a voice? Because clearly the campaign didn't, didn't show you enough of that. Um, and just on the campaign, if I could, like, you know, there was a moment where Australians, voters, started asking for details and we had the audacity to be like, racist. The irony here is that we lost an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament because we failed to listen to the voter. And that, that's got to sit on not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, those who voted yes or vote, those who voted no, all of us. I think we missed a genuine opportunity to walk together. And that, that's very sad. Got to move on.
quite a bit. Wow. A really, a really powerful answer, Todd, honestly. Um, Leigh, I know you were obviously uh, incarcerated for a lot of the time leading up to this, but you did come out as we, you know, found out how Australia voted. What, what are your reflections on that? I was brought back to vote. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so did um, you get to vote? Yes. Wow. Um, and in fact, coming back, because I sort of lived in China most of the time for the past 20 years, and when I came back, um, I discovered that I felt it was more inclusive, more interracial relationships. Um, people were more mindful. My kids are super aware about racism, about sexism, about LGBTQ, and about um, indigenous people. So, to me, I'm not as, obviously not as despairing as, um, as Todd. And I just think we stop whinging and start fixing. You and think? Like um, Charlotte is with Hilma's network. So you think work can be done still in this area? Not all is lost? I totally believe it. Mm. Wow. Oh, without look, firstly, Todd, thank you so much for yeah. sharing. Um, your story is amazing. <laughs> and as heartbreaking as it was to hear it, I know it's you've just spoken. People can't be what they can't see. Mm -hmm. And if they haven't seen another person feel that way, and you voted very well. And look, it doesn't matter what I voted, it doesn't matter how any of it. Like, when I saw that we'd gone from mostly wanting to do it to, oh my God, the UN's coming to take my backyard. <laughs> I don't care how you voted, I have no quarrel with you, but if you're not terrified of how quickly we were manipulated as a country, if you, didn't, if you want, don't want to start asking questions about who flooded the zone, we need... Like, we're really lucky... We're really lucky that it wasn't during a car key election, you know what I mean? We're really, really, really lucky. Um, but to, to, to move forward, um, coming here tonight, I was like, who do I call? I called... I'm going to drop a name called Professor Megan Davis. Like, what are, what are you doing? And, <laughs> and she says, um, she goes, uh, she says, I have hope. Dull. She told me, so I, have, I have hope. She goes, for the first time, we actually have evidence. Yep. Six million Australians want to vote, want to walk, want to walk forward to a future for a better path for all of us. Six million is a lot of people. We saw what 100 people did in Newcastle the other day. Six million is a lot that they cannot be ignored yep. at the next federal election. Yep, that's four out, of, four out of 10 people are educated on this issue. That's how I see it. So if 60% voted no, We've got four out of ten who are, well, who are there? Fact check it if you want. But. <laughs> six million is a lot of but people. But six million is a lot. It's also not a majority, though, if no. we, right? And, and so there are lots of different reasons why people voted no. Some people just didn't like the model. Um, some people probably did have racist views. How do you see it, Charlotte? Oh, look, I think um, it's, you know, it's been a, such... Uh, a divisive year for so many different reasons. And it also feels like these divisive moments are happening more frequently. And uh, I do absolutely think that there is work that we can do in a constructive way that is going to really uh, unite the country and that's what we all have to focus on now. But that was the chance. Do you truly that believe that? Do you truly believe the leader of the... Do you really believe that Dutton wants to unite us? And yeah. just in a price wants to unite With us. With all of your heart, hand on heart. <laughs> I think um, I think the question is really the how of like the the diff. Yeah, I no, 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 no. I just goal... care about the why. Why do you believe he wants to? Because if you tell me the why, I'll believe you. But I don't believe he really wants to. No, I absolutely believe that both Peter Dutton and Jacinta Price do want a united Australia. It's just the different machinations and the different methods of getting there. Yeah, but this was this was the model that we, like, I mean, you didn't communities, ask me why, communities, okay. communities across Australia, Aboriginal communities across Australia, for for, for two decades, three decades, have been talking about this, mm. and like, I, what what more did we need to show Australia around what it is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples wanted? Like yeah. the, the the division that I think was set forth by um, by the No campaign was very clearly an architect of of the division. Yes. Like that's what I just like. I mean, I yeah. get your point. Like I really no, I do. Just, but, I guess but at the for same me, time, I mean, in New South Wales, our Liberal leader Mark Speakman, he voted yes, mm. as did a lot. Many of, liberals did. Yeah, but like, so I'm just saying, like, there's, we are a broad church. There were there were plenty of liberals that voted yes, and plenty of liberals that voted. But no. I mean, you had Justina Price, so whose, they're, whose they're own not... community voted yes. Let's start there. Like, 
most most remote Aboriginal communities voted yes on this, despite Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine coming out saying, oh, no, remote communities don't want this. It's too divisive. And it's like the evidence is very clear that that was the one community who probably, out of I think most of us on the panel are, are doing well, are fine, but the one community who actually needed government yeah. support Anthony, and actually needed a voice. I'd love to bring you in here because mm. I... If there's someone who gets across this country a lot, it's you. <laughs> See, the Did thing... you know that it was going to be a no? Oh, I didn't want it to be a no. And first and foremost, um, I just want to say, I'm really sorry that you went through that. Like, that's... But that, how many times are we going to say sorry? Kevin did it in 07. <laughs> let's move, like, I'm let's... I'm talking about from me but to thanks, you. Thanks, um, <laughs> but I just think taking politics out of it for just for two seconds, it, it comes down to just listening to people's stories. That's how you learn. And for me, I'm a, you know, I'm a big believer that Indigenous studies, for example, should be compulsory in schools. Sometimes I feel <laughs> so ignorant because... I just wish that that was compulsory at least until year nine or year ten. Because it so, wasn't, I'm assuming, when you were at school. No, we just did history in general. But I'm like, I want to know the history that has built this, that is of this country. Mm. And I feel as though that I don't want to be ignorant. Mm. I want to, to know more. And I feel as though if we can bring a new generation up having more understanding and conversations about the truth of our country, then I think that's that's the way that we should move forward and that's the only way that you can make change. I agree. Now I'd like to...